Hello. Welcome, everyone. This Thursday lecture, we're going to discuss the question, what is the role of architecture? We all approach the profession from different schools of thought, from architecture solely as an act of sculptural form making to architecture as the all-encompassing tool to build a more equitable world. To question the role of architecture is to interrogate our place as architects in the fabric of the profession and to search for meaning in our craft. This questioning is a way to describe or quantify our agency to react to the world and our lasting impact on it on its builders. It is a question that must continually be re-asked, even just to reaffirm a current position. Today, you will hear just two perspectives of many on different sides of the spectrum. This confrontational discussion will help us find a common ground and expose nuanced differences so that we as students can develop our own perspectives moving forward. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Ben Pinnell and Greg Tu. They will each begin with a 10 minute presentation on their perspectives and then we'll move into a moderated and an open discussion. Greg, you have the floor. So I'm curious, how many of you have taken design appreciation? Okay, uh, life in the built environment? How many have had both? I don't know who any of my students are. I've got over 5,000 right now, but it's all anonymous. Um, so um, we'll see how this goes. Uh, the confrontational part, I'm not sure how that's going to unfold. Um, I understand that all of the faculty were invited to participate, and Ben and I were the only two that agreed. Um, <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. So the question is, what is the role of architecture? And the first thing that came to mind to me was a quote uh, from Le Corbusier that said, you employ stone, wood, and concrete, and with these three materials, you build houses and palaces. That is construction. Ingenuity is at work. But suddenly, you touch my heart. You do me good. I am happy, and I say, this is beautiful. That is architecture. So you know, I think that that is a big part of what we do in the school, is focus on this idea of touching the heart. You know, and it can be, I grabbed an, an image off Ben's website. Um, I don't even know what I'm looking at exactly. It was labeled as a basement, and it seems to be a man holding up this sort of beautifully soft ceiling space. And I think it, it rises to that level of touching the heart. There's also uh, a photo from a fall travel this past fall uh, of the little sort of hidden chapel at Corbu's La Tourette that somehow manages to be sort of both monumental and intimate at the same time, which I, I think also touches the heart. But, you know, not all architecture has to do that. I don't think anyone expects the cereal aisle at the grocery store to necessarily rise to that level. Um, but it's nice when you walk out of the grocery store that maybe the space is created by the architecture does in some way touch the heart. So I think there's a sliding scale here, you know, at the sort of extreme end, maybe it's the joy, that touching of the heart when you see your child being born, and then maybe at the lower end of the, the spectrum is a, is a really nice little square of chocolate. Um, so not everything has to be sort of extra large capital A architecture, I think, to, to be architecture. So I think that this question largely depends, what is the role of architecture, depends on who you ask. Um, so there's this element of satisfying needs. And again, as an architect or architecture student, we put a lot of emphasis on the aesthetics and maybe this idea of touching the heart. I also think it's important to consider uh, the importance of architecture as it shapes our quality of life. But then there are these practical considerations like shelter, comfort, accessibility, safety, uh, and even financial concerns. Um, but if you're not an architect, and again, I teach a lot of students and I get a lot of feedback on these kinds of questions, and financial concerns uh, end up being a big part of it. Uh, and things like shelter and comfort rise to the top, and then the things that we maybe care more about uh, don't rise to the same level. But then the, beyond the, the needs, what, what does architecture need to satisfy? They're the wants. 
And I think in this case, ethics starts to play a role. Um, the medical profession, they take the Hippocratic Oath with its central tenet being do no harm. And that becomes, a, I think, a useful segue to think about the role of architecture when we think of the environmental issues that we're dealing with globally today. So in these two charts, we have the global greenhouse gas emissions on one side and the US greenhouse gas emissions on the other. And if you sort of take out the agricultural element, really everything else is very strongly connected back to the built environment. And because of the way we have chosen to build things in the United States, our dependence on transportation is almost double the global average. And that's a problem. And that's why even though we only have 5% of the global population, we have 30% of global energy use and 28% of global emissions. So our impact as each individual in the US is something on the magnitude of six times that of the average person outside of the United States around the world. And part of it is because of things like this. We build neighborhoods that are single use, housing only, and to do any other thing outside of your home requires getting in a car. Um, you know, and here the ethics, the question is, is the ethical question really on the home buyer or the people or the system that allows this to be the system or the way of building that, that we use? And then at the higher end of this spectrum are houses like this. It's beautiful, beautifully crafted, uh, but this is a 9,000 square foot house with flat roofs and glass walls in Montana. I lived in Montana for six years. That's not really the best way to go, but throw enough energy at it and you can live comfortably in a house like that. Um, so then I think with these things in mind, culture becomes part of the equation too. So. Uh, I've always been drawn to the Churchill quote that said, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. He was referring to the sort of two sides of the British Parliament with the two groups facing each other that reinforced their two-party system. Um, but I think in the US, uh, the way that our buildings have shaped us is that far too much of architecture today is what I would describe as buildings and parking lots. Even our homes have parking lots. We have parking garages and we have driveways that serve as, as parking lots. And we basically move back and forth in automobiles between our homes and buildings like these that are completely unremarkable uh, sitting in their parking lot. And then we leave for lunch uh, to sit in our cars and make the lap at the Chick-fil-A uh, for a bag of salty fried chicken. And, and head back to the, to the office space. So this is where I get very confused. And my interactions with my students, they think that cars are the most efficient way to get around. And if you've grown up in this environment that I've just described, it makes sense that it is the fastest way to get around for sure. But in no way is it efficient. And we struggle with this. So, you know, we'll complain bitterly when gasoline gets over $3 a gallon. Um, but if you think about the average automobile, say it's 4,000 pounds, uh, the number one selling, number one, two, and three selling vehicles in the United States for a decade or more have all been trucks. Uh, so we are a truck driving nation now. And Ford Motor Company doesn't even sell sedans anymore, only trucks and SUVs. Um, but right out of the gate, 90 plus percent, really closer to 95 percent in the energy and the gasoline that we put in those vehicles is used to move the vehicle from A to B. Only 5 percent of that energy is used to move you from A to B. So it's not at all efficient. And then the efficiency goes down way below or, you know, down to 1 percent or less when you factor in that much of the energy in the gasoline is lost to heat, uh, rolling resistance, wind resistance, and so forth. So in effect, when we burn gasoline in our cars, it's like going to Starbucks and taking one sip out of your frothy drink and on the way out the door, dropping the rest in the garbage. So 1% efficient. So we don't think about the 350 for the Starbucks coffee and we complain about the 350 in the car. So it led to a chapter in one of my textbooks uh, that I titled Shovels or Bulldozers. 
And in that chapter, I talk about this idea of efficiency versus expediency. And I say that when you build with shovels, you have to be efficient because it's really hard work. And that's what led to places like hill towns. But when you build with a bulldozer, it's more efficient to just expediently push the hill out of the way. And if you're not familiar with the definition, expedience is conventional or uh, convenient or practical, although possibly improper or immoral. So it's about profits rather than quality of life. So even our best architects, when they work in this environment, and I'm a fan, you know, um, uh, Marlon Blackwell's incredibly talented architect, but it is a building and a parking lot. And, and it's in an uninviting landscape there in Arkansas. And it's this bad. So I did a Google search. And if you live in this house on the other side of the highway, you're only 900 feet away from your pediatrician's office. Yet, if you put in, how do I get there by transit, it just tells you to walk and it takes a half an hour, okay? It's literally three football field lengths away, okay? That means my time is up. I'm almost done. Um, so the sad reality in the United States when we think about architecture is that we have a zoning system that requires a very expensive approval process if you wanted to build anything that looks like the top photo. But we allow you to build by right the sorts of things that are the least efficient, least beautiful, and most isolating uh, ways of building. So another quote that I've been drawn to for many years, uh, and again, this may be a bit of a paraphrase, is from Andreas Duwani. He said, you can't design good buildings with ba bad zoning. And this was in the Financial Times, a British publication just last week. It said, the urban ideal is a 19th century with 21st century enhancements. And I think it's correct. So in these uh, photos here, um, this is what I would describe as our 20th century mistake, this totally auto-dependent way of living. And then on this other side, two cities that you know, you've maybe never visited and they're not remarkable. You know, they're not the destinations, but the one on the top is Oklahoma City, uh, where they created, dug up the streets and put in this sort of river walk experience. Uh, it's very vibrant and busy. And then the bottom photo, they tore out a highway across the falls uh, in Greenville, uh, South Carolina, built down a walking bridges. And it's now, by removing the automobile infrastructure, it's now much more vibrant, much more engaging, and a lot of investment has gone into the quality of that downtown. So when we think about now the role of architects, I would say we need to put a lot more emphasis and really make our number one priority being um, transforming zoning policy and transportation policy. So that's it for me. Hello. Um, I'm really glad to be here today. I hope that we do this again. I think this is a really good format. Um, so this is my first slide. Um, Greg and I uh, feel the same way, I think, about uh, most of public space, although we may express our concerns slightly differently. Um, the slide says architecture. Oh my God, let me set my timer. It says architecture is the physical and metaphysical presence of territorial conquest. It is the surrogate for an individual or body politic. And so this is a picture of a dog urinating on a tree. Um, for obvious reasons, I think that this is ultimately what architecture is. Um, I've been uh, listening to almost all of Joseph Bedford's uh, world history course. And for those of you who may have uh, you know, not paid attention or slept through a few classes, if you're in your fifth year, I recommend uh, re-watching those videos. And um, 
they, they've, they've led me to this conclusion um, that uh, essentially this is what an architect does. And uh, the thing about it, is, and something beautiful about uh, the animal kingdom, is that other dogs don't really mind, actually. Uh, like when a dog urinates on a tree, another dog doesn't say, hey, that's my tree. What the hell are you doing? The other dog goes up to it and, you know, sniffs it and maybe as an act of, you know, celebration, pees on it himself. And it's this, you know, shared act of celebration. Um, on the broader world stage, uh, which is a finite space, the quest for territorial growth is uh, obviously problematic, leads to lots of conflict and bloodshed. This is an image of uh, Luchins in uh, New Delhi, and it obviously represents the uh, English colonial powers stretching outward towards the east. Um, it is an image of the governor general's house and so on the one hand, it represents the image of the governor general, possibly. Also, it might represent the architect. Both of these are individuals. It might also just represent uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, if anybody saw the founder about Ray Kroc and McDonald's, you know that McDonald's is probably one of the most powerful uh, post-colonial acts of land conquest. Uh, its entire real estate holdings equate approximately 150,000 acres of land. Uh, so they are basically the most prolific builders of our time. Oopsie. This is a slide of the Palace of Versailles, but it's such an iconic image, we don't really need the photo. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> And um, I, it was a quickie also. Um, the Palace of Versailles, in comparison to the land owned by McDonald's, is only 2,000 acres. So it's like approximately 1%. So you know, this is a new paradigm in which we are living, which is no longer about you know, singular, finite kingdoms, but is more about this, uh, this atomized situation. Here is an image of the first moon colonizers. I think this is Buzz Aldrin uh, standing in front of the American flag. Um, why does one need to colonize the moon? That's a perfectly legitimate question to ask. Um, my answer is because we can. Um, there are plenty of noble things that uh, equally deserve this incredible amount of capital uh, and research which went into this project. Um, but uh, certain individuals chose to pursue this instead. Um, it is an example of uh, acts of, well, unspeakable acts of courage and bravery. And with the American flag in the foreground and the lunar lander in the background, I consider this an act of architecture as a form of uh, territorial conquest. Uh, animals and humans have a need to mark territory, to claim territory, uh, to steal territory, however permanent or provisional or possibly despicable. The instinct has temporary effects for the present moment, but there are other more lasting metaphysical consequences which are more desirable, that is to leave something behind after we have left, left because um, we have simply gone to the store or left because we have uh, left this earth. So it's a trace of, uh, of ourselves, of our DNA, of our aura. So certain things that we leave behind, possibly uh, on a more instinctive basis would firstly be uh, children. We leave children behind, kind of copies of ourself, clones of ourself. Um, we also leave behind inscriptions on our tombstone, uh, which I think is possibly why Andrew Holder's lecture was titled Inscriptions, because it has to do with this wish to 
leave behind a trace, a uh, signature of yourself. Uh, very simply, just say that you existed. Um, this is an important. Uh, this is an important desire for a human being to know that they exist. Um, also, we leave behind works of art. Uh, the idea of the Starchitect is, uh, I think, out of favor. Um, I know I speak to a lot of young uh, designers all the time, obviously, because, uh, well, I, I teach them. And uh, they express uh, unease and dissatisfaction with the quote-unquote Starchitecture symbol, which propagates the idea of a singular uh, image or signature which in a way colonizes, germinates, spreads throughout the world uh, indiscriminately. This, by the way, is uh, Frank Gehry's signature, Frank O. Gehry. Um, here is an image of the Great Pyramids, an example of a person using the eternal strength of stone to preserve their posterity after they've left this life possibly owing to its sheer size, which is an immovable thing, the territorial boundaries marked by the spiritual instruments remain unchallenged. This is an image of uh, Saudi Arabia's most recent project, I guess, called The Line. Uh, most of you probably know it. It's a 100-mile-long city and if it's built as planned, it will be the single most gargantuan structure envisioned and realized by human beings. It would be the eighth wonder of the world. And for this reason alone, and in spite of the risk and the cost and the baseless morality of the endeavor, I nevertheless consider it to be a completely noble and legitimate thing. Uh, I have mostly talked about very large mega projects, as is my want. Uh, someday I wish to design a 200-mile long line, possibly beginning in Blacksburg. Um, you know, my students, uh, I said, oh, the line is despicable. You know, I can't imagine it. And then I said, yeah, but if you were in Saudi Arabia, would you go visit it? They're like, well, yeah, of course I'd go visit it. You know? It's like, well, why would you go visit it? Um, so um, I want to talk briefly about more small and subtle acts of resistance. This is the tank man who's protesting uh, these, uh, these uh, violent um, uh, like martial law activities by the Chinese government in Tiananmen Square. The tank man is an unidentified individual who at least symbolically stood up to the tanks. He didn't have a tank, he didn't have a car, he didn't have a building, he didn't have a gun, he had himself. And uh, no matter how briefly and no matter how small, he stood on his own patch of ground and marked his territory. The next example I want to talk about as an act of resistance would be uh, graffiti writing. And uh, I think that these are most conspicuously seen in places like this, freeway overpasses and underpasses. And this is uh, symbolically quite uh, poetic and potent because freeways are you know, generally thought to be some of the most despicable, physicalized instantiations of, uh, of, of modernity in all of their destructive force. And so uh, graffiti writing to me is um, completely legitimate. I'm going to give myself an extra 90 seconds like Greg did. Uh, graffiti writing to me is completely legitimate, even if it means somebody occasionally drew a big penis, let's say, on my own house. I think that this is just something that we accept. Uh, why? Because I don't think that anybody can really permanently own space um, or territory. Uh, graffiti teaches us that um, you know, power and space is uh, provisional. It's an act of resistance, dissatisfaction, self-expression. This is the only image of contemporary architecture I've included. 
I don't know where the, uh, there's a white square there. This is uh, Wolf Pricks' project in uh, Los Angeles for a public high school called High School Number no. 9. And it looms over the uh, Highway 10. And this is the last project that I'll talk about as a form of resistance. This was made by several friends of mine um, while they were in graduate school. This is called a memory go round. And this was designed about four or five years ago when there was a lot of uh, published controversy about uh, Confederate uh, war monuments. And I thought that their proposal was absolutely fantastic. Uh, instead of uh, destroying these monuments, which, you know, formally are, you know, beautiful works of sculpture, because simply they're carved pieces of stone, um, despite their, you know, symbolic ugliness, um, their proposal was to take these uh, Confederate statues and. Uh, and put them inside of this childlike uh, merry-go-round, thereby, um, you know, you know, preserving the the formal beauty, the physical presence of these original statues, but at the same time, you know, mocking them, challenging them, and um, you know, thereby expressing, uh, you know, some form of uh, you know lack of acceptance. Uh, protest, uh, etc. So um, that is the image that I will conclude with, and now we will have a discussion. Testing. Let me get you this one, Greg. I'll hand you this one. This All right, so now we'll move into a slight moderated discussion. If it's an opportunity for Ben and Greg to ask each other questions and respond, and then we'll open the floor up to the audience to ask any questions. So I'll hand this mic over to Ben. Would you like to start? Um, yeah. Uh, well, I had the benefit of, of hearing your, your lecture first, um, and it kind of made me think about, you know, uh, yes. Well, what I was talking about, but um, uh, you say that architecture should uh, touch the heart, um, and my question is: um, Is there something that architecture can do specifically? Because music touches the heart, um, film touches the heart. Uh, you know, obviously, all of your images and examples of urban space have to do with architecture. Um, but I was, uh, I was uh, wondering if um, there was possibly something a little bit more precise that architecture delivers. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting question. You know, I think architecture, you know, really becomes the frame where lots of other things happen, whether it's music or theater or so forth. And, um, you know, one thought that's been running through my head a lot since this invitation came out a few weeks ago, and I don't even really know what to make of it, but my favorite, one of my favorite professors as an undergraduate who went on to become, I mean, it, it's a very crass sort of thing that he said, and I'm going to share it with you, but he was a very good professor, ended up being one of the design intelligence top 25 guys, a guy named David Beagie, he taught at Arkansas. He's actually uh, good friends and works with um, Marlon Blackwell. But um, he came in one day and he said, architecture is bullshit compared to basketball. And I was a first year student and I just didn't even really know what to make of that. I don't think I ever asked him uh, because it's so confusing. Um, and again, in one of the, sort of sessions I sat down and sort of played with what I would talk about today because there's so many avenues I considered. Um, I came across an article and it was, I'm working on the third edition of one of my textbooks, so I'm reading all sorts of stuff all the time, but it was talking about how a lot of um, recording artists are ditching their uh, agents 
to to sort of run their concerts and so forth on their own. And um, it was Bruno Mars that they used as an example. And I was blown away to find out that one of his videos has over 2.5 billion views on YouTube, uh, which seems unfathomable to me. So I watched it twice. Um, so two and a half billion and two. Um, and it, you know, it was just interesting to realize that you know, we labor over the things that we do fairly anonymously. Um, but at the same time, it is profoundly important. Um, and it's, it's valuable to us, I think, when we do it well. And it's damaging to us when we do it poorly. Um, so I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but you know, this is something that's sort of been sitting on my mind and uh, you know, preparing for this today. Um, another possibly follow-up question um, is um, for me, because I'm an architect, um, I was asking myself, what is, what is the role of architecture? What is, what is the role of an architect personally? And um, you uh, talked largely about uh, its effect on the public, uh, but not so much the effect on the client who may have commissioned the building or the architect who designed the building. Whereas I feel like uh, for me that was the that was the general focus of my 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 slides was. Uh, the effect of uh, the effect it has on the architect as this like adventurous form of conquest or on the part of the client, and I was wondering if that uh, if that uh, you know concerns you as much or at all. Yeah. So I struggle a lot with. Um, Sometimes I feel like as architects, we are trying to do what we're trained to do and what we've studied and uh, labored over as students. Um, but it feels like the deck is stacked against us uh, quite often. And, um, you know, the power seems to reside with uh, the deal makers. Uh, I was in a conversation just the other day here locally where um, there's 500 acres across the highway in Tom's Creek area that is apparently in play. Um, and it's heartbreaking to think that it's going to lead to 500 more acres worth of single family homes that have minimal to no architectural involvement, that the design, as far as that goes, is largely being uh, led by civil engineers. Because the rules are set up so that to even get to the table uh, to uh, gain permission to move forward with a project like that, um, requires sort of mundane things like stormwater calculations to prove that uh, you're not going to add to flooding. And I sort of say, well, you know, we're also going to have to have uh, egress windows and things like that in the houses that we might build. It's like, why are we not asking, asking for that level of uh, specificity on those things? And um, so I think, sadly, we're in a situation where architects come to the game far too late in the cycle of trying to move projects toward realization. And then ultimately, we all sort of suffer the consequences of the sorts of things that are being built. And again, I think most architecture and most building, I should probably say, is the product of this uh, sort of expedient process where the number one priority is the profit of the uh, development and investment team more so than the impacts that it has on the people that ultimately live there for, for decades or centuries even. 
That leads me to one of my questions for Ben. Um, what do you believe is the relationship in your point of view between the architects, the clients, and the developers on who is creating what is left behind for future generations? Um, what is the relationship between the clients, the architects, and the developers? Um, Oh, um, I, it really depends. Um, um, people have said that a lot of the success of uh, Gary's project in Bilbao has to do, of course, mostly with Gary's uh, idiosyncrasies, but also it has to do with the specific person who was in charge of the Guggenheim, whose name was like Tom Kranz. And uh, Tom Kranz had some like very specific requirements about how he wanted the museum to perform and feel. And, um, and so in that instance, the project, you know, was under an incredible amount of like external pressure and like performa from this client. And Gary has had subsequent projects since then with an almost limitless amount of freedom and the projects have been not so successful. And so I think that, um, you know, uh, ultimately, well, I don't know about ultimately, but I do think that a lot of great works are certainly the product of uh, collaboration between the client um, and the architect. Um, but uh, I think that uh, things are quite different now. Um, uh, Noam Chomsky talks about, like, the declining interest and devotion within corporations. And so, um, say for instance, a corporation like, you know, Ford Automobiles in the, you know, 1930s and 40s, if you worked for Ford, you were a quote unquote Ford man. And your entire life, your pension, your livelihood, your identity was, you know, deeply embedded in this concept of Ford. And Ford was, you know, striving to exploit workers. It was, you know, trying to create a monopoly at all sorts of, um, you know, questionable moral uh, programs involved. But there was a core, um, you know, allegiance and like loyalty to the idea of Ford. And so that produced a lot of, you know, beautiful architecture in Detroit and, you know, similar corporations like SC Johnson and so on have like, you know, very beautiful, impactful, modern works of architecture, which, you know, embody their corporate identity. And nowadays, um, you know, people don't even have a loyalty to their own company because it's likely that you're only going to work for Uber for two years. You might be the CEO of Uber for, for two or three years and then, you know, jump ship to a slightly higher paying job. So people have no loyalty to their job. They have no you know, loyalty to their corporation. And so there is a, there is a lack of personal uh, human identity associated with these, you know, with these commissions. And so therefore the client doesn't really exist. Like a lot of important, um, you know, uh, star architects complain that most days, mo most projects these days don't actually have a client because a developer is simply concerned with the bottom line. They don't have the you know, they don't have the the thoughts and concerns and sense of like civic pride, however arrogant and ugly as that may be, they don't even possess that. It's simply the bottom line. And so in our times, I think it's possible to find clients who are truly inspiring, useful collaborators in an architectural project. But I think, um, probably nine times out of 10, the creativity and success of a project is gonna come almost entirely from the architect's own self-will. Would you like to ask any questions of Ben? Sure. Or respond to them? Yeah, so Ben, one thing that sort of I mean, I'm questioning about the presentation you gave is you're making the comparison between a dog marking its territory and architects essentially doing the same thing. And on a certain level, I don't disagree with that. Uh, I've, I've certainly had that feeling in some of the work that I've done over the years. Because, I mean, buildings are a lasting 
you know, Mark, they, you know, some of them, some of them disappear within a couple of years. But, um, but I think, you know, one of the points that I try to drive home and really both of my classes is that given the situation that we're in today with climate change in particular, that to lead a higher quality of life in the future, we may have to choose a lower standard of living that we, you know, because the standard of living is simply stuff. And, you know, when you factor in the money that we're squandering building highways and, um, you know, the cars to drive on them and so forth, that doesn't leave much money left over to do the qualitative things that we would love to see. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, whether it's an individual choosing you know, the smaller house that's walkable to the things that they do in their days, or as architects, um, is sort of taking a more modest view of the profession and say, our job is to sort of be civic leaders um, and not necessarily focus so much on the monuments that we leave behind. Because unlike the dog, it's acting on instinct. instinct whereas we have the ability to choose the actions that we take. So I thought that would be something I'd like to hear your thoughts on. Well, uh, the dog example, um, he is, or the dog is acting on instinct, absolutely. And, um, and uh, as human beings, we've, we've evolved from our, you know, barbaric ancestors who would do God knows what. Um, but uh, the, you know, the reason why I like the dog example is because, as I said at the beginning, the other dogs don't mind. The other dogs don't like, you know, bitch and moan and say, hey, you know, he did that. They, you know, they sniff it and they enjoy it and then they contribute to it and then they say, maybe I'll do that myself. And uh, it's a very like positivistic message. Um, about uh, you know the the upcoming you know generation of, of architecture, and um, one that I think needs to be uh, said. Um, I think that uh, you guys are probably all like Greta Thunberg's age, right? Uh, oh, a little older. Yeah. Oh, okay, what is she like? Eighteen or something now? Okay, well, I mean, you're virtually her age. Um, I think that there's a there's an overwhelming uh, amount of cynicism and like lack of trust, um, and all of that is uh, obviously well founded and based on fact. Um, but uh, I think that uh, you know uh, we as architects need to be proactively engaged in this territorial conquest. In other words, like, you know, would it be terribly difficult to, uh, you know, uh, band together, in a matter of fact, we should talk about this, and buy that fucking 500-acre property <laughs> near Price's Fork or whatever you're, would it be that difficult? I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, how many people of us are in this room? What do we have a collective? What do we have a collective capital wealth of like, uh, you know, like uh, twenty million dollars? That's easily enough for the down, you know. So, I mean, I could design it. I mean, you know, I, I don't know who. I don't know who would. I mean, maybe me. I don't know, but you know. So, um, so uh, you know, I, I I think that you 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 have to play. You have to come to the table. And if something is unsatisfactory, you have, you know, you have one, cho you have two choices. You can write about it and you can protest it, which is valid, or you can take action and get your hands dirty. Yeah, I, you guys can't expect it. I, uh, but I actually admire Ben. Uh, I don't know him well. I've only sat on a review maybe once or twice with him, but I, I did go out and look at your house one day. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I think your sort of proactive interest in not just being an educator, but also trying to, to practice what you've learned. And, um, you know, because you really do learn so much more, I think, about the full scope of architecture and, um, you know,
know, our place in the world as architects when you are actively engaged in it. Um, and, you know, you'll make some mistakes and you'll get some things right and, and hopefully more right than wrong. Um, but, you know, I, I, I tried to do that myself when I was a younger man um, and continue to do it a bit today. Um, but it's something that I think all of you could, you know, learn from. And it, it takes guts, but, you know, frankly, it's much easier to fail when you have nothing uh, and recover from it then uh, you get more conservative as you age because uh, when you take hits later in life, it's harder to bounce back from it. So, um, yeah, I definitely think uh, we all need as professionals, as architects, uh, to be much more actively engaged. And it, it, it truly breaks my heart to think that there's probably not an architect in the room when discussions are being had over how to develop those 500 acres, and that's Blacksburg. You know, there's 5 million acres probably, you know, along the East Coast, if not 50 million acres that are in play at any given time. Uh, again, with the architects coming in probably three steps too late in the process to have the kind of positive impact that I think that we all hope to do with our, our work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question for Greg. How do you recommend that we bring the architect back earlier into the design process? Um, well, it, so I think the question is wrong. Um, it, 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 a lot happens before design ever happens. Uh, that most projects are determined based on a spreadsheet before designers are even called into the room. Um, and, you know, I have tried and failed uh, to launch a pretty big project. And actually, uh, just today, we went and listed the land that we have on Main Street with a realtor. Uh, so if you're in the market for a half acre, uh, with a pre-approval for a 27-unit condominium building, um, which was no small feat in Blacksburg, it is now for sale. But Why did uh, that well, because I was probably too idealistic, and we developed a design that was too expensive to build at the time, uh, and we shopped it around, and uh, you know, and there were thousands of hours of time and a lot of money invested. Uh, to get to a starting point where an experienced developer probably could have told us right up front, it's not going to happen, um, not in the form that it was that was in. So, so I I think that for architects to have a greater role in the development of the built environment, we need to know how to do the math. Uh, we need to understand the things that developers understand and then find a way to elevate that conversation beyond what is on the spreadsheet or look for creative solutions uh, to move it in a slightly different direction, but to be there in the first conversation rather than being brought in after the basic performa has been established in terms of what they're hoping to accomplish. Right. We can do a brief response, then we'll open the question to the crowd. Yeah. My response is that I, I, I simply agree 100%. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, the nuts and bolts behind, um, like, entitlements and, um, you know, finances behind how a project gets realized is, like, of life and death importance. Um, if architects wish to have this individualistic role in, or, or not individualistic, but if they simply want to participate in a meaningful way using the skills they've obtained in school. All right, that was very interesting. We've got about 15 minutes for questions, if anyone in the audience has any. Okay. Uh, 
Um, okay, cool. It's working. Um, so I was wondering um, exactly because you guys seem to be talking about like the public versus like the architect versus like the developer and all the people that are like involved in the planning. But even though you guys seem to be discussing about what the how the or at least um, more so Professor Two. Um, discusses how the public is going to use or be impacted by it. There's very little discussion about how the public can get involved, and I was wondering what your thoughts on that were. So uh, in my own little small way, uh, the primary reason why I teach and have grown my classes to teach so many people is I want every student here, and I would love for every college student all over the country to have some exposure to the importance of design in their lives. And it has been really surprising to me how little thought they give to it. Um, you know, we can agonize over, uh, you know, things that we might be buying on Amazon, or maybe we don't, we just click buy. Uh, that was a bad example. Um, but, you know, we, we may say, you know, really take pride in the choice of car that we buy. Um, but then we just sort of accept that we're going to live in a cookie cutter suburban house uh, where you have to get in the car to go for a walk, right? You know, if you want to take the dog for a walk, you have to drive to the dog park. Um, and not recognizing that that's not okay. Um, so it has really been shocking to me how little awareness the average person has about the importance of design in their life and their quality of life uh, and their financial quality of life, not just their sort of, sort of spiritual, emotional, sort of walking through their days. Uh, they just don't have that connection because we are a suburban nation. Uh, I really believe that Americans go to Europe and you know they save up for the two-week trip. They go there. Um, and they stroll through parks and, and sit at a sidewalk cafe uh, surrounded by other people, and they're living their dream vacation, and it never crosses their mind that the people sitting to the left and the right are living their everyday life. Um, and then we fly back home and get in line at the Chick-fil-A, right? And, and somehow forget all about that. We post the photos on Instagram and call it a day, right? Um, and somehow we just sell ourselves short in terms of what our best life could be, I think because we're so far removed from uh, the joys and the experience of kind of moving through life um, by walking out of your front door and doing the things that you do. I have a slightly uh, different take on it, um, although it's based off of the same observation which is that um, considering the fact that the public is so unaware of all of these glaring defects, um, I think that the public uh, should, <laughs> in large part, not be involved. I don't, uh, I don't trust them. Um, <laughs> why on earth would we trust them? Uh, you guys are receiving a professional degree, five-year degree in architecture. A lot of you will go on to receive masters. Um, degrees. Um, so we are the ones who know best. That's why we're here, so that we can provide for the public what they don't know they need. Um, I think it's a, I, that's a great point. And um, the, you know, I think that, you know, we, we cherish our freedoms in this country. You know, it's, it's a big deal, right? But somehow we fail to see that we have very little choice about some really important things. You know, if you want to own a home in the United States, your only choice at this point for most people is in the suburbs, uh, particularly if you have children, because people will buy to get their kids in the best school districts, best school districts, which has a lot of racial undertones, but that's a story for another day. But um, but Thank you. all right, I think we have another question. Okay, so 
your propo um, the proposal that we should, um, why should the public be trusted? I propose as the, um, the, you guys are proposing that a lot of other professions and their jobs should be almost, should be given the responsibility to the architects. So therefore, why should you be trusted in the ideas of planning and early decision making? <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't trust me, that's for sure. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, it's our duty as architects who wish to make an impact to, you know, coerce and cajole and manipulate to our last dying breath the, you know, sheeple, you know, who write the checks that we will deliver the goods. And if you're not capable of accepting this, you know, questionable morality, then um, you're going to have a problem. You're going to have a hard time building anything, anything that you want to be made in a particular way. Well, I, I think Ben said it earlier is that we need to be part of the collaboration, I think, from the beginning, because um, I will be the first to admit, because I've taken my licks, that there are a lot of things I don't know about real estate development. But if we could figure out how to get the building built, um, then I think it would be a, a real benefit to the architectural character of the town. Okay. Um, so I think my biggest concern is at this point, we've just done a poor job of making sure that we have a seat at the table. Um, and, you know, so I would, I guess I would leave it at that. I would also just say, like, one other thing, like, uh, the line building in Saudi Arabia could easily fail. I mean, there's a 90% chance that it will fail. It'll fail in many possible stages. It might not get built. I mean, they have begun building it, interestingly enough. There are dozers on the ground, as they say. Um, but, um, but what if it succeeds? I mean, what if it is this miraculous thing? I mean, the video renderings are truly extraordinary. What if it is great, you know? And, you know, people are, like, challenging, you know, suburbia. They're challenging the even sustainability of cities, they're challenging everything. And then, you know, the moment somebody comes up with a radical idea, I find it depressing that the first people to scoff are the 18 year olds, you know. Uh, you know, it's the, it's the young <laughs> who are supposed to be extremely stupid and naive and say, oh my God, it's 100 miles, let's build it. And yet the young are like, oh, it's not gonna get built. It's, you know, the <laughs> seagulls are gonna run into it and die. And it's like, what on, what planet are you living in, basically, is the, you know, question I wanna ask. All right, I think we have time for two more questions and then we'll close it out. Hi, um, so I find it very interesting what you got, you, it, we started with a conversation on design and kind of moved away to that, moved away from the design into the preliminary of how design is even allowed to be. So a criticism of mine of our program is the lack of that pre-consideration. So do you think we may be teaching or approaching architecture wrong or maybe not including the right information to get to where we need to be. Give it to me. <laughs> uh, I think that we are doing what we're supposed to be doing, to tell you the truth. I think that uh, school is the opportunity to learn the craft of design, um, that is designing well, constructing drawings well, possibly even in the wood shop, learning how to construct a chair well. And um, just speaking for my own personal experience, I had a hard time truly being engaged in these other extra architectural matters until they were actually real. I find the idea, I've said this before, but I find the idea of simulating reality in a school to be utterly preposterous for me personally. And so I think that you will have plenty of experiences 
and plenty of time to learn and you know um, you know approach these you know grander meta architectural questions urban questions that you're talking about but I think that they will happen in the real world and it's not so interesting in an academic context it's not so fun either you know and a lot of people would probably get turned off as 18 year olds if the first thing you did when you came to architecture school was you know zoning diagrams and what have you so I think architecture school is basically good <laughs> Um, I would say that we do a lot of things right, but I think we could do some other things as well. Um, you know, it's a big profession, and you know, one of the things, I, I think the strengths of design education is that we just think about things differently. You know, I think maybe we see the bigger system of things a little differently. Um, and the reality is not all of you are going to be great designers. Um, I don't really consider myself to be a great designer, but I am greatly interested in all things that relate to the built environment. And I am frustrated that I didn't at some point learn how to do the things that would help me launch the kind of projects that I'm really interested in. And I really believe that we can teach anyone that wants to learn anything at any time. Um, so, and certainly in a school as big as this one, um, I think we could certainly have lots of tracks. You know, some people are, you know, totally interested in theory and history and are going to go to graduate school and may end up teaching uh, or writing at some point. And others are going to become project managers in office. And others might decide they want to be a real estate developer, that they can, they can enter that conversation on the first day and bring a different way of thinking about projects on that first day um, to ultimately, I think, get us all to a better place. And uh, I've got a little video in one of my classes, uh, links out from the textbook, about the sort of hypothetical conversation between a traffic engineer and a citizen. And it's this sort of robotic thing, and it's this back and forth in a very deadpan voice from the sort of robotic traffic engineer and this concerned citizen. And it basically, this is back and forth, it's like, um, you know, why are you writing and, you know, the citizen is asking, why are you widening the road? It's like, so the fire department can respond more quickly to the accident. You mean the accident because cars are driving faster? Yes. You know, so it's that sort of thing where I think sometimes other disciplines that are contributing to the built environment, and i sorry if I'm offending any engineers in the room, sometimes they are just looking for the the again the simplest answer to meet the the standard and they basically respond to lots of standards um, without really thinking about the bigger picture of how so many other factors might weigh in toward a better solution so uh, yeah i would agree that we could have more to open the doors to the people say, like, yeah, I really love architecture, but I'm not kidding myself. I am not the best designer in my class, but I want to be engaged, and I'm going to be engaged in a different way, but we're not providing those tools. You can maybe grab it somewhere else on campus. All uh, right. We have one final question, so include any sort of closing remarks you want in the answer. Uh, I wanted to go back to Ben's um, analogy with Tiananmen Square. Um, you know, Tiananmen Square is this uh, vast state space um, is designed to express state power um, as the architect probably intended it to be. Um, but one could argue that the physical size of Tiananmen Square is what allows the massive amount of people to assemble and the cultural things that are imbued within the space are what allow it to become this historical protest. Um, so I guess what I'm asking is, in your view, um, is architecture simply the vessel upon which people uh, imbue their territorial expressions, or if the architecture itself is acting 
um, I guess in other words, is the architecture the active P or the passive tree? Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the, you know, the most, it's based, it's, well, I mean, I would just, I mean, it's a fantastic question, by the way. I mean, you know, just the question alone and, um, but I would say it's the architecture. I mean, I, th I feel like just asking the question is way more important than my answer, mm -hmm. frankly. But uh, but I would definitely I would say the architecture is more important. I mean, that's that's where the people gather. You know, the as you said so you know beautifully in your question, it's like you know the, the people are 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 channeling the the energy of that space which is already there. If they were simply in a desert somewhere or you know, nestled in, you know, some medieval street with tiny little passageways. It wouldn't have the same, you know, reverberating mass, volume, et cetera. It's, uh, the power comes from the architecture, both as this, you know, long-standing monumental presence, but as an architect myself, I that the power is the, the act of making it, you know, seeing it take place. It's such a it's such a, an exciting, you know, loud, dangerous, gritty thing, you know, just like penetrating the earth, scraping his giant hole, casting the foundations. I don't know. That that is where the that is where the power lies for me is the architectural act. I guess I'll just just work on the day. I guess I'll just move to a closing remark. Um, you know, first, I've enjoyed this, and Ben, I greatly appreciated the things that you had to say. I'll give it some thought in the days ahead. Uh, I hope that we can maybe twist some other faculty arms and uh, <laughs> keep this going, because I, I think that these kinds of conversations um, are maybe a little better than just sitting and soaking it up. But uh, So thanks for everyone that organized it, and I uh, hope you've enjoyed it.